Welcome to this episode of Robots in Depth. Today I'm happy to have Michael Nelson from Danish Technological Institute here. And we're going to, as usual, talk about everything within robotics that he can share with us. Um, I usually start with the question, how did you get into robotics? Why are you in the field of robotics right now? Yeah, that's a very interesting story. I come from an academic career from Aalborg University, doing a PhD in, uh, in agricultural uh, machine vision, doing 3D reconstructions of plants. At that point, I had nothing to do with robotics and didn't have any intention of working with the robots. Then I had a quite long academic career within that field and also as uh, assistant professor in media technology in general, teaching for students. I went to UC Davis in California, which is a university that's one of the best within the fields of agricultural engineering and applying vision at the Basel Lab under David Slaughter. And then uh, I met my Italian wife who did not want to move to America, so I had to find a job that was closer to Europe. And then I got headhunted by uh, a job uh, headhunter for t that found matched me, my CV, with a job application from Danish Technological Institute, Robot Technology in Odense. And they wrote that now they want to do something within uh, computer vision and agri agriculture engineering. So that was just perfect for me. And then I got the job and I just stuck on and have moved more and more into robotics. Mm, very interesting. The, 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 the banana <laughs> peel of meeting somebody you love. I've heard that <laughs> so many times. That's per, per, truly a personal experience for most of us. Yeah. Uh, there is a very lovely song called That's How I Got to Memphis. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's how you got to Odense. Yes. Didn't stay in Denmark. And I got to New Shopping the same way. So, um, so you, then you're, you're here at the Institute uh, and you're in computer vision with yeah. some focus on agriculture or field use, outdoor use. Could you give a, a primer how you started your work here at the, the Institute when you came here? And then we'll go on with what you've been doing since then. Yeah. So the first uh, project they had back then was the, this agricultural uh, safety for uh, auto guided vehicles uh, in agriculture. And that uh, meant a lot of field work where we had to record data. So I had to make a very robust software for the uh, interfacing with cameras and buy new cameras for them because back then they didn't have any real machine vision cameras or gear they were using webcams and uh, kinects and such things and i wanted more sturdy gear for outdoor usage that's the benefit of uh, working in academia in agriculture engineering because there we also need very robust uh, hardware to work outdoors yeah, a webcam and a shower of rain isn't really <laughs> compatible, and and USB connections that uh, aren't really. It has to really. work. It has to work while you're out there when you're driving with the tractor outdoors. You have to make sure that it works after all these being sh shook around and mm. vibrations, yeah. dust, and and also physical knocks and bumps. Not only yeah. so really sturdy stuff. Huh? Yeah, and you only have this one week where you set up the experiment and all the other partners from uh, Europe are coming with their gear and just has to work there. Yeah, so you have yeah. to s spend a lot of time building a robust system to start with and then just test it to, to the reliability you need. Yeah. yeah, and I guess duplication is also an important thing there that you, you have multiple versions of the same sensor. If one breaks, you could just employ the new one or... Oh. Yeah, not really, because we were. I was doing stereo vision fused okay. with thermography, and the thermal camera back then cost over a hundred thousand Danish kroner. So, so you we didn't have, have to. We, baby didn't, we didn't have two of those. No, <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's what you go and tell the boss. I need two of those. Can I get another hundred thousand? <laughs> uh, because uh, yeah, but it's it's it, so the, the field application is very challenging, and you have to really yeah. be able to. Uh, think on your feet there and when because if not if things break but when things break how do we get the most out of the experiment anyway because you have that week of, yeah. of doing this and and you really want as much as possible out of that yeah. so can you tell us about of any of, of, uh, about can you tell us anything about those experiments that you do in the field yeah, but the first part of there was about doing safety. So we wanted to fuse uh, thermography with stereo vision for detecting obstacles. Usually when you do auto-guided uh, vehicles or mobile robots, 
we have a ro mobile robots team. They are mostly working indoor in a factory environment where you assume a flat surface and everything that sticks up uh, is will be something that's an obstacle. Uh, <coughs> in aquaculture, that won't work because you are driving uh, around in bushes, which are also sticking up from the ground. So you need and something else. We're using this uh, fusion method. We had radar, we had LiDAR, we had uh, thermography, we had stereo vision. We tested even different kinds of stereo vision types. Uh, the Italian partner had m multi baseline uh, stereo, but with normal dynamic range. I bought some cameras that take fast images, so I could take multiple images very fast after each other and fuse it for uh, high dynamic range, so I could see the shadows and uh, the blue sky in the same image without uh, any blooming. Or ah, anything. very interesting, because yeah. outdoors is a very challenge, and as just humans, we don't really consider this how hard it is to see outdoors for a robot because yeah. our eyes are such wonderful devices and yeah. they can really handle this very challenging even situation. the eyes get uh, issues the timing range if you look at in the car and it's very sunny if you then drop something and look down then you it'll take you some time to adjust yeah yeah and, and robots are even more challenged can you you said multi-baseline could you elaborate on that uh, because i've not yeah. heard about like that. we have two eyes yes imagine that you have three eyes mm -hmm. our two eyes work around nine meters range mm -hmm. That's when we can see depth or the outside there. It doesn't matter if you're looking with one or two eyes. You don't see the depth from having two eyes anyway, mm. uh, because they the they're so short uh, distance between them. After that, you use gestalt therapy or using occlusion and assumptions about what you're looking at. Mm. Of course, you can program that in, into a camera too, but. Uh, the Italians were looking at uh, then multi-base line where you have a second set for longer range, so mm. you can still see depth information. Ah, so you have a, a two sets of eyes for close range and then you have a third eye and you uh, can even have more of them, I guess. My, my setup was that even wider than theirs. So, mm. so, uh, so the wider they are, the better distance detection you get yeah. further away. Yes. But do you also lose something when you get close up? Uh, so is uh, there a trade-off? As you get closer and closer, then you lose the having an overlap between the two ah, cameras. So. And then when you get too close, you, there's no overlap and you yeah. simply see with only one eye. So yeah, you really have to use both of them. And then also you have to have some method of detecting which, which image am I going to use of these two or three or whatever you have. How, do you, how does the robot select which image, which, which of the three eyes to use? The algorithm they made was to just fuse the point clouds. Ah. So they were, you had point clouds out to 40 meters or so. Mm. Uh, there's another way to you make use of having multiple cameras that I used during my PhD, where you do the correspondence across the whole line. So you could have five cameras on a row and then make use of you usually want to find correspondence between a point and one camera and the other. And then you know if you have a, an equal division of the baselines, of course, this is calibrated so they don't have to be exactly equal, mm. but you get a virtual I imaging setup where they are equal. So just say if the disparity is 100 pixels, then it will be 20, 40, 80, 100. Mm. And then you can find the best point that optimizes this energy. Ah, okay, okay. So there's many ways to do this. I yeah. haven't seen it being used in robotics because there you usually have close close yeah, up images because you don't want it's hard with a robot robot to have eyes wide apart yeah. with they do something like stereo for sure. robots picking and such mm. uh, but just uh, normal stereo with two and maybe projecting a pattern mm. see the thing is that we made this for agricultural engineering like i was used to, used to but it was just a way to build up our competences within the department of uh, the robot department so now, now we have suddenly some gear. Now we have real lenses, real cameras, and filters for the cameras. We bought a filter kit, so we started up our vision lab. Mm. We didn't really have that when I came here. Then mm. we built that up and said, okay, now we have this stereo and thermography. Where else can we use it? Then we started the trash sorting project, mm. where we are already still using uh, stereo fused with thermography. So I have a, I can make a 
Point cloud, where for each point I have RGB, near infrared information, I have the thermography information. Then I said, okay, to use this to see the materials, then I also project heat into. So I bought a studio flash, that you, uh, you as a mm. film guy would know mm. that they have a lot of power. It's uh, 20,000 voltage uh, that it start, uh, mm. starts the e explosion basically inside a tube with xenon gas, and that gives a huge spike of heat that can I can measure up to seven degrees of increase in uh, in rubber, for example. Black rubber will increase a lot. Metal won't increase a lot, no matter what the color is. And so then, what you can see out in our hall is demonstrations where we pick out plastic from paper because the plastic is colder. So then you're not only passively watching the image, but you're actively engaging with, with your surrounding, with yeah. this heat flash. Could you also use different frequencies of heat uh, or different frequencies of energy to, to tell different objects apart? Or is it just the general uh, heat thing? I guess if you had a lot of money, like I'm talking a couple of millions of kroner. Mm. <laughs> Sometimes you bought 500,000 <laughs> euros, then you could do hyperspectral uh, long long-range IR, which is basically what thermography is. It's mm. long-range IR mm. to see temperatures in our dwelling. Uh, if mm. you want to see d uh, 4,000 degrees, then you can see it in a normal camera, mm. because then it starts to glow red and mm. finally blue, mm. like the peak mm. of the heat it uh, emits mm. goes down and down towards the visible range. Mm. Where we, lo we are looking at uh, around 10 uh, micrometers with a thermal camera. Mm. Uh, very that can be turned into something that's hyperspectral, but uh, at the moment we're looking into hyperspectral imaging for robotics, where we are looking at these cheaper solutions with uh, spectrographs in front of our normal uh, machine vision cameras and some head world cameras that co with an in-gas sensor, if you know what that is. No. Uh, normal cameras are based on silicon. Yes. Uh, so the so the. Their ability to convert photons into uh, an electronic charge that you can measure and sample uh, and digitize, uh, then in gas is sensitive above the visible range. Ah, okay, okay. The okay. camera we just got is Infra one. So that we're talking near ultraviolet. No, no, near infrared. Okay. So above the visible range, so mm. up to uh, 1700 nanometers. Mm. Uh, with that, we want to uh, build that into a robot system, so we can just have a like a one-touch <laughs> teach button to teach. Now I want you to pick this material, and then I will learn that. We already made some demonstrators based on a camera that we rented mm. uh, for tri sorting, mm. and I'm also looking into with some um, greenhouses to control. See, we can use it also for process control in the greenhouses and we uh, have an another agricultural project now where we want to fly with a drone so we paid extra to get the camera compact enough that we can actually fly with it mm. because the one we rented was uh, like five kilos and then you need a serious <laughs> drone to fly with <laughs> yeah. that uh, so we bought one that's less than a kilo now so ah very interesting very pay, interesting it cost double to get that <laughs> yeah <laughs> some t but that's usually because of the low production volume, when this yeah. becomes a, a thing in robotics, it's surely going to drop in price yeah. and become more available. Okay. Um, so then you have all these different images. You have the regular camera image. You have uh, images from different parts of the spectrum. You have uh, depth information. And then you fuse all these together. And from that point on, the robot can then look at the whole image, so to speak. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about how you fuse them and how you use the different data sets to, to, to fuse them optimally together? The thing is, we need the 3D to actually segment what objects we're looking at, because it doesn't make sense to just have a spectrum from uh, for the whole image, and we don't want to just do uh, simple thresholding. We want to look at the shape of objects. Some objects are not defined by their material, like a lot of things, a lot of toys and home appliances will be made of pretty much the same plastic, but uh, we need to look also at the shape. We're also looking into this uh, new buzzword called deep learning. To, so we can combine these fancy new algorithms with fancy new sensors and make them available to uh, robot integrators so you can actually use them in factories. So we have integrated all these things with uh, Pickmaster, for example, so any integrator that uses ABB robots, they can easily uh, use thermography to control the process or for picking 
or they can use uh, <coughs> hyperspace for images and deep learning algorithms. Uh, we can talk to the global product manager uh, at ABB, and he's looking into these same algorithms that we are looking into. That was very interesting. Yeah, that, that <laughs> tells you that you're probably on the wrong, right track. Yes. Yeah? Because he sees this demand from his industry partners. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, that you wanted to use the shape of objects. How do you detect the shape? Uh, is that from a LiDAR point cloud or is it from... Yeah, we just uh, tested a lot of uh, well, a couple of our projects. The first uh, milestone was to actually do some experiments with different kinds of 3D generating sensors, like sheet of light where you project a line. Mm and you have to slide it over and then you can get 3D from the displacement uh, of this line. And then we tested uh, time of flight. That's become a new buzzword also. A lot of producers like SICK, which is huge, and Basler, they are coming out with time of flight cameras. We still don't like them. They are too noisy and too low resolution still. What time of resolution are we talking about so that people yeah. know? <laughs> like three to five millimeters resolution mm, in mm. a typical setup of a conveyor. Mm. And sometimes even it says that the part that's on top of a table is under the table. That would destroy a lot of things if we put that into a robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want the arm to go through the no. table. And you have a broken robot and a broken table. <laughs> and the sheet of light was a bit, it was making a lot of reflections. So we also got some strange shadow effects. So still we like stereo vision best. We can much better control the the accuracy and we can buy pre uh, pre-made uh, dot random dot projectors like FLAs they make a random dot projector that we can strobe so it's very powerful mm -hmm. then we can make use say do we want the neon infrared do we want the blue one the blue one seems to give the best resolution because it has uh, the frequency of the light is so small that it will not uh, do scattering in the surface as much. Ah, okay, okay. The sharper point, basically. Yeah, so we get a much... I built one uh, for my old project. Uh, I built one myself uh, from IS Online, just ordered some parts and made a projector. Just like I had done at UC Davis, where we made a... Hu uh, we turned a Hen Hensel Studio strobe into a large random dot projector so we could project it onto a whole tree in an orchard. Ah, interesting. Uh, Again, the field I, work I made the same design but for very small, made based on LED to put on our conveyors. Because mm. uh, the, the range there is in the range there is in the few maybe few meters maximum yeah. uh, rather than a whole tree, which is many, many yeah, even a tenth of meters. That's three by four meters range yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. We could almost see it even in daylight. That that's how powerful it was. <laughs> oh yeah, cool, cool. Because the indoor environment can be challenging in one way. You need to tell two very similar materials apart, um, and you need to deal with 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 the shapes that are entangled into each other. Especially if you're doing this garbage or recycling sorting, sorting. Uh, but outdoor work is even more challenging because you've got varying sun and uh, shadows from from the sun and leaves. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a bit about how you try to employ these outdoors? Um, how do you overcome the very big challenges of, 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 of shadows and stuff outside and also the distances? Because here you, you need to, to look at something that's quite big. As opposed yeah. to indoors, it's usually smaller. Huh? A lot of tricks we can do outdoors is to like basically shield it, have a, like a light tunnel. I've done that when I worked on tomatoes and we made our light tunnel. Uh, for the agricultural safety, we are we cannot do that because we are looking in front of, we are not looking down at the crop, we are looking in front of everything. Mm. So that is solved with the HDR and not just using uh, multiple slopes as a lot of cameras can do, but because that doesn't give you that much extra uh, dynamic range, but actually doing this multi-exposure. Mm. So I made the software so we could choose to want two exposures or three. And then I'll have a factor on the exposure of uh, a factor eight between each. So that is a huge difference in the in the brightest image and the darkest image. And then you merge them like yeah. you would with HDR. We took that set up also for exhibitions like at Automatica, mm. where uh, a lot of people would like try to find the easiest way for them to set up a camera where there would be no dynamic range and uh, looking away from all the flashing lights. I found the worst possible. 
because I needed to demonstrate that I could handle that. So I found the worst possible way. Uh, we were in a corner, so I could have done it easy, pointing at the wall. Instead, I pointed it outwards, so I saw all the robot installations in the background and all the flashing lights. Mm. <laughs> and still you could read the big signs. I had a lot of uh, projectors on them. Uh, and that impressed people a lot. Mm. So then you're taking two images in rapid succession with the same camera. Yeah. What kind of delay is are there between them? How how long time is the between the frames? And is there anything you, as a robot developer, have to consider when you're doing this? Not at the exactly the same time, but with a slight delay. If things are moving, then you will get some artifacts for the safety uh, application. That didn't matter because I wasn't looking at the exact shape of things. Well. I wasn't measuring. This is ten centimeters long. Uh, so this artifact, it happened in both cameras since they were synchronized by hardware. Mm. So it was the same artifact in both, so just actually helped me doing correspondence. Um, the cameras I used back then was 100 hertz cameras, so there was 10 milliseconds between each frame. Mm. But that was fast enough, so even if I was about to cross a road and people were going by 100 kilometers per hour, then I could still see the car in the frame. Mm. Uh, with both the exposures mm. and mm. having maybe tw 20 centimeters gap between them or so. Mm. Uh, and now are they are there higher speed, higher frequency cameras that you could use the same it's technology a with? A matter them? of money, how much you want to pay for them. You can also get uh, 500 hertz cameras if you want that. Mm. Where would you think to be the practical limit in, in a kind of an agricultural sense where things aren't moving at a thousand kilometers an hour or something like that? What would be the high-end frequency you could you need? Um, would it be 500 hertz or would it be some other figure? What I'm working on doing right now, I'm, I have as an aim that things should be running uh, at 30 frames per second. That's what I consider real time for those mm. applications. Mm, mm, mm. Interesting, interesting. Could you also, if you need a more exact setup, use two cameras? And is uh, is the synchronization between two cameras ac uh, accurate enough to actually take okay. a picture at exactly the same time? That's very accurate. As I said, you use hardware triggering. So they will be triggered at the same time with maybe two microseconds delay. Yeah, and two microseconds. If 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 this uh, two ten milliseconds gave you about twenty centimeters on a car driving, how much would the same uh, error be when we're two, talking two microseconds? It's like millimeters, right? Yeah, yeah, but even in my old experiment when I was merging these cameras with thermography, the thermal camera could not be hardware triggered. They, it runs by its own. Frequency uh, 50, f 50 frames per second. Uh, so that's 20 milliseconds between frames, and I could only say the next one I want to keep matched with the other ones. And even even then, my with this car that was going by with 100 kilometers per hour, even there, the thermal image matched very well, even through software synchronization. Mm, mm, mm. So the timing is not that critical, no, but okay, for okay. doing the stereo, it has to be very accurate. Ah, okay, okay. So if you're doing monovision or just just vision, the the frequency of the cameras and the timing of the release isn't that uh, critical. No, because but it's, it's but that's because it's bigger objects I'm looking at. Mm. Of course, if you have a pendulum mm. in front of a camera that's uh, ten pixels wide, then you would lose the. Mm the overlap between that and the other camera if you have up to 20 milliseconds delay. Mm. And, and if so you're it's all looking at the, everything is relative in this domain. So yeah. And if you're also using stereo vision, you also have a higher requirements for, for this. Uh, is uh, that true? Uh, between the cameras that I do stereo with, it has to be extremely accurate. Uh, when, things are moving. when you're saying extremely accurate, we're talking about hardware triggered. Hardware trigger? Are we talking then then microseconds again? Or? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that kind of limits you to what cameras you can use. Uh, as far as I understand, the thermal camera would be a challenge then because it couldn't be hardware triggered in that way. Yeah, I've seen some papers actually looking into doing stereo with the thermal camera. There's multiple issues with that. First, finding one that you can hardware trigger. Uh, I found one that promised it could, but it didn't really work that well. It uh, acted weird and the support. Uh, 
of the camera just said, yeah, we haven't really tested that mode you're using, so we cannot help you. <laughs> <laughs> you knew more about the problem than <laughs> yeah. they did, and they, you didn't know that much. So. And they suggest I use what we call a trigger pre uh, pre-select, which means, again, the next image that comes in we want to keep, but that's not good enough. No. Uh, but I do believe that they do have a sync out, so you can synchronize the clock of two cameras, and then the pre-select would probably be enough. I haven't tested that. Mm because there's also a second problem with using thermography for stereo is that, and that is that all these textures we see on things are not really there. Mm. And I don't know how to make a, p a pattern projector in the in that range because things are not that, like the good lenses we use here where we can have very sharp images that that doesn't really exist in that domain because it's a completely different wavelength. It's a, that means it's a completely different material the glass has to be made from. Mm. to be like normal glass is not uh, transparent in that range even. Now you, you, actu you actually want n prefer it not to be because the IR yeah. screws with your regular sensors. Yeah. So, uh, so you have a, an issue there too, there won't be all those textures to look at. Mm. Right now I'm actually looking into I, the paper I have to write today. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm, I'm keeping him <laughs> from his job here, so I hope you appreciate him taking the time. So. There we are using deep learning to actually classify what are we looking at uh, also agricultural so are we looking at the maze now which is the crop are we lo just looking at grass are we looking at a lake at a car at a at a human so it's a critical obstacle uh, is it a, just a building and things like that and it seems to be working quite well with the amount of texture that's there mm. I just don't think that the texture is enough to actually do the correspondence for stereo Ah, okay. And also, you, you don't have the same control over the shutter time and all that in those cameras, so you have too much blur when you're moving around. Ah, um, okay. And so the two, if you have two sensors, then you have a, do you know about CCDs, has something called a black current that you have to keep under control. That's what's making your noise. It, okay. Like the heat that gives you some noise. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. black current starts to go up as it heats up. Mm -hmm. In a normal camera, you have that under control. In the in-gas cameras for the near infrared, mm -hmm. it's not so much under control. So there you have some strange looking images. Then you do some mathematical compensations that you have to recalibrate all the time. It's even worse for a thermal camera. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at the temperature of your cloth down here, then it will say, okay, that's around 10 to 20 degrees. If you don't keep calibrating every five minutes, then it will start to rise and rise and rise and be more it and more creeps. jittery. Yeah. Oh, that's that's complicated. Yeah, and so there are some practical issues with thermography. Yeah, and then also when you calibrate, the system is offline. Can you? Is that true? Or and I how do it all the time? It? Basically, set it up to calibrate every five minutes or so. Mm, and yeah. how long does calibration take? With the smaller cameras, it's a second or two. Mm. On the big, very expensive camera that I used in my first experiments, that was five seconds. So yeah. there you wouldn't want to rely on that for safety. <laughs> no, you can't have a camera that, that's that's <laughs> offline every no. a second or two every five minutes. I'm so we need the smaller that ones that uh, which, which is faster. So we're looking into that now. Can we use these smaller cameras that has a faster uh, calibration routine mm. and what or just, just what happens if you just don't calibrate it but do it in software can mm. hard to compensate so mm. looking into how can we control this better because you, you want to also we also want to use uh, thermography for process control like mm. we had one project where we looked at a uh, gluing a gluing process to follow the glue because the glue is heated so mm. you can see and it's white on white. So on a normal camera, the contrast oh. is very low, but on th thermography, it's amazing. And the part is colder than, yeah. than the heated glue. But in the process, we know when we want to look at it and when we don't. So we can always, we can- Calibrate we can when you're not Control using. this calibration. Because you don't want a safety robot that's blind one or two no. seconds every <laughs> five minutes because you yeah. just bet you that that's when somebody steps in front of your vehicle. Yeah. Or, or so I'm thinking to build one where we have multiple of these so, yeah. uh, so we can carry around one at a time so it's not completely dark. Mm -hmm. But that also doubles the cost and yeah. doubles the complexity. But the thing is, the thermography is interesting now. Mm -hmm. well, it started being interesting in 2011 because they started to make cameras for industry and automation back mm -hmm. then. Before that, a thermal camera was something where it made a pseudo color image for a human to see contrasts. Mm. Uh, then they started to say, okay, maybe we can use this in automation. For automation, you need uh, an absolute value, not a relative value that automatically scales the contrast for a human. Mm. But you want uh, 
temperature linear values that you can trust and you need an interface to control all the parameters, you need an interface to control this calibration. When does it happen? So it doesn't just do it out in, in the blue. Mm. And that meant also the price started coming down. Mm. Very interesting, very interesting. And, and now you can get a thermal camera for, uh, for 100 euros. Yeah, even though that <laughs> probably will have some limitation. Yeah, and we, we're, we're looking into what is the limitation. When can we use that? And how can we when work do we around need, them? When do we need to buy a, a more expensive one? Mm. Mm. Very interesting. And, and, and um, as with the glue there, there are really cool applications where one, appli one camera doesn't see anything, but another camera, it's, it's really much easier. Yeah. And it's combining all these together yeah. and knowing which camera to use in which situation and, and how to, to optimize this. That is the, the, the hard part in your skill then. Uh, yeah, and also to make it available for integrators because it's nice and all that all this exists for researchers to to use and show a lot of uh, applications, but we also need it to be available to an integrator at a, at a level where the integrator will trust that they can base the system on this and will be easy to maintain and it has to be maintainable for the next 10 years. It has to be maintainable for them so because they have 24-7 support. Mm. Uh, they need to be able to go and I've deployed uh, vision systems based on normal 2D quality inspection together with integrators in many different countries and the integrator, they will go and fix something in the middle of the night uh, in Ireland if it breaks down there. And for me, they'll have to wait until the weekend is over so I can log in over TeamView, right? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> so it needs to be something they can use and when they get new products, we need a way to have it. It has to be easy for them to use also. Mm. Like SICK is really good at making, uh, taking uh, advanced computer vision algorithms into their smart cameras uh, with an easy to use interface for integrators and people with no education in the field. So it has to be something that's easy to set up and you just press a button to teach it mm. something. And also, as you say, reliable because it's used in the field. And uh, yeah, so there's yeah. many challenges around this. Yeah. Uh, could you describe one of your more recent projects? What are you trying? What are the fields of application that you're trying to, to uh, use ro your robotic uh, or your computer vision in? Uh. We are doing custom-made vision systems, which means if it's too simple, it's not our job to do it because then SIG has smart cameras to do it. The PIM60 can do a lot of standard vision inspections. They are even making 3D uh, algorithms available now where you can just show it a shape uh, and then teach, this is the shape you have to look for, give me uh, the pose and position of that one. Uh, so we are looking into when you have to do a lot of inspections on something uh, like uh, give a cap cat model to a 2D camera and have it give you six degrees of freedom pose. So we use a, a machine vision uh, library called uh, Halcon, which has the biggest set of uh, algorithms for us to combine. And it has the option to then also combine with our own algorithms through extension packages. And it helps off with the whole pipeline, speaking to OPC, like putting data into a PLC. It has a uh, socket communication. It has all the grabbing interfaces with a lot of things like also the SIG ruler. Um, and that's a very good head start. So you can combine all kinds of algorithms there, even uh, sample-based identifiers where you can have a database of 10,000 different classes and it will tell you this is the one I'm looking at and it's independent of pose and even if you move things around. I used that for a recent project where we needed to check if we can have a database of boxes. I cannot tell you which kind of boxes, but some boxes that ha has to identify. You don't know what comes in. It can be any of 5,000 different boxes. It has to identify it. You have to look at all six sides. Mm. Uh, so I take the image from all six sides and unwrap it. So we have this stitch yeah, yeah, yeah. with all six sides in one image, then I identify it. Then I have to compare the graphics is as it should be. If there's defects or holes or anything new on it, they change the design of it or something like that. The font has changed. Mm. The text has changed and I have to find that out. So it sounds impossible to then find out which arbitrary 
uh, box is this first before you can start to compare it, <laughs> right? Mm. And uh, another difficult thing is that it also has to, when you see something it doesn't know, mm. it has to automatically put it into the database so it can inspect the next one it sees without any human intervention. Yeah, so it, it kind of teaches itself there. Yeah. Yeah. And that means suddenly, because the first idea would be, let's use uh, deep learning, because that's extremely good at classifying images. Mm. However, it takes a long time to train. Mm. So we cannot do that because you, you have two seconds per, per box, and you cannot train a neural network in two seconds. Mm. Mm. But mm. Helcon has a method for that. Yeah, very interesting. And that worked very well. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, so it's very uh, it's been very interesting to hear about how you use this both inside sorting recyclable materials and also in the field uh, because we know agriculture robotics is an area that's growing and that's very interesting to follow that growth um, so thank you very much for taking the time to do an interview yeah. it's going to be interesting to follow your work with uh, all of the thermal problems you're working through and seeing what's seeing what comes out of computer vision yeah. in the few in the coming years so thank you very much yeah. I hope you liked this episode of Robots in Depth. I'm proud to produce Robots in Depth with the support of the sponsors, Carbon Robotics and Aptomica. Carbon Robotics is redefining the relationship between humans and machines by making advanced automation dramatically more accessible with low-cost robotic arms, integrated vision, and a powerful task intelligence engine that automates tasks no human was born to do. Carbon Robotics is proud to support Robots in Depth in their goal to elevate the global robotics ecosystem. Aptomica rents anything in modular robotics. Dream, rent, build. Visit aptomica.com to connect. If you like this episode, tell your friends, give us a thumbs up, subscribe and turn on your notifications. I am Pat Sherboy. And I'll see you next week in another episode of Robots in Depth.